Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. This is part two of my Philips 286 laptop video series. Now if you missed part one of this video series, please check it out. I'll put a card in this video below. And in that video, we kind of went over the system as it was booting, but it had a couple of issues. Most notably, the CMOS battery failed. So among other things, that's what we're going to be tackling in this video. But what I also wanted to do with this video is to show you a little bit about the internals of this laptop. And we're going to kick things off right away by removing this little plasticky cover here so kind of slides on out and what it will reveal is two screws that we can remove to get this front plate cover off so we're going to go ahead and do that so this gives us our first glimpse of the internal circuitry of the laptop we don't see a whole lot but i already see what appears to be a memory module a BIOS chip, I see the ribbon cable of the LCD, I see the VGA BIOS of Cirrus Logic. But to get to the complete internals of the machines, we need to do a little bit more unscrewing. So there are a couple of screws here on the back that we need to remove, on the side, on the bottom. And once all of these screws are removed, we can gently see how we can open this up. And that's always a little bit tricky with these laptops because there is a specific sequence of events that you need to go through. In this case, we need to remove the keyboard first, which kind of slides on out like so. But you need to be very careful because because the ribbon cable of the keyboard is very short and you don't want to break it off. So uh, you need to gently uh, get that uh, ribbon cable off or that flex cable off, which is very tricky because normally you need to open up uh, the connector itself, but because it's very space limited, it's, it's very difficult to do so. So yeah, being very gentle is the key here. But then we get the keyboard off and what we see immediately underneath the keyboard is a second battery, the hard drive and the 1.44 megabyte disk drive. So let's see if we can get these off. It's a little bit fiddly to get the hard drive out, which is enclosed in this little case here. But uh, after first removing that second battery pack, which is located here, we were able to get the hard drive out relatively easily. And let's take a look at this hard drive. Void warranty if removed. Hopefully we won't be needing to do that. So this appears to be a standard IDE hard drive. So let's open her up, slide it out of the case. And I really love the look and feel of these old hard drives. This is a very early 2.5 inch laptop hard drive from Connor, the CP2024, a 20 megabyte IDE hard drive. So yeah, really, really nice to see. I did see some comments in the previous video on this laptop where um, the kind of bumper stop within this hard drive gums up and you get the same issue like I had with the quantum uh, hard drive a few videos back. So I hope I won't be running into that issue. But yeah, standard IDE connector. And this is one of those IDE connectors made specifically for laptops because as you can see here from the pinout, the five volts both for the logic and for the hard drive motor is provided by this IDE interface cable instead of a separate power connector. Now, speaking of IDE cable, this is the kind of flex cable that was used. And I accidentally punched a hole into this cable as I was removing it. So, yeah, this is something that needs to be fixed because we don't have good contact between these two pins anymore. But now, before we continue with that, let's first see how to get this top cover off. There are a couple of screws that we need to unscrew and then we need to be very careful because we also have the ribbon cable here for the LCD panel. So we need to be very careful and first lift up the connector here and then very gently slide out the LCD ribbon cable. And once we have that removed, the only two connectors which are still in place is the connector here for the uh, Varta battery that we removed in the previous video. We also have the power connector here for the LCD display. And once that is out of the way, we can completely remove the LCD part. 
Now underneath this little plastic cover we have the little Dallas bastard here that we need to tackle. It's protected by this plastic thing to kind of roll the LCD uh, flex cable in a certain way I suppose. But yeah this little chip here is causing some problems and will need to be replaced. What you also often see in these old laptops or old computers in general is that, that that plastic becomes very brittle and it's very easy to snap off, for example, which is the case here. Now, next thing I'm going to be removing is this battery pack, which is uh, which was kind of glued into the, the frame here. So this is a 4.8 volts, 1200 milliamp hours battery pack. It's connected to this uh, separate board, which sits on top of the main logic board. Just uses this special connector here. So I'm gonna be removing that so that we can get the battery pack out of the way. Now we still have some screws to unscrew here in order to get the motherboard out of the case. And there are in fact two PCBs at play here. The kind of light greenish one is the power board, which contains the power connector from the power brick. So this is mainly to deliver power, to charge the battery and, and stuff like that. As you can see, a lot of cables have been patched here. So these are obviously power cables and battery cables. And they use these two connectors to hook them up to the logic board. Here we have a RAM stick. So the computer has one megabytes of RAM provided by this stick here. And here we can see the BIOS chip, which is not mounted on the motherboard directly, but it uses this kind of small PCB um, that fits into this connector here. I'm also going to be removing the 1.44 megabyte disk drive, again using this typical flex cabling that you see in laptops, you need to be very careful with those. So I'm just going to gently open up the connector because you just can't, you know, pull the connector out of here. There are these two little hinges on the connector itself that you need to remove. And finally, the only thing we need to remove are the two screws here on the VGA connector and one additional screw that I didn't initially see. And then we can uh, pop everything out. Let's just get the disk drive out of the way. So we have a Sony 1.44 megabyte disk drive, uses this flex cable to hook up to the logic board. And now we should be able to pull this logic board or motherboard out of the case and take a closer look at it. And let's take a look at the motherboard. The first thing I notice is just how small it actually is for a laptop from the early 90s. I mean, if you already look at the form factor of the laptop, you can imagine that it would be fairly small. But yeah, I was really surprised to see it in, in real life that uh, the motherboard was actually a very small form factor. Now on the motherboard, we have two PS2 ports, one for the keyboard and one for the mouse. We also have other I.O. So we have an external floppy drive connector, a parallel port and a serial port. We also have this special port, which I think is for a docking station, not 100% sure. We also have an external VGA connector, so we can hook up an external LCD or CRT. We have an optional floating point unit. This is the floppy disk controller for the 1.44 megabyte hard, uh, disk drive and the external floppy drive. So here we have the connector, it uses this flex cable to hook up the disk drive. At the core, we have the Intel 286 running at 12 megahertz. There are a couple of chips here on the motherboard that I haven't really found out what their purpose is. If anybody knows, feel free to leave them in the comments. The chipset is provided by Headland, which was very popular for these 286 and 386 based computers. The computer BIOS is socketed in a little special uh, daughter a PCB board that hooks into a header on the motherboard. And the same goes for uh, the memory slots. So we have two headers here 
to uh, give the computer a total of eight megabyte uh, maximum. This one is only fitted with a one megabyte stick. So this one only has one megabytes of RAM. We have a PC speaker here embedded on the motherboard. We have the notorious Dallas real-time clock chip. We have an IDE controller for the hard drive. Here we have a chip marked VGA BIOS, which I think is just the video chip. There's also a Cirrus Logic chip on the bottom. Here we have the video memory, 256 kilobytes of video memory. Now, if we move to the back of the board, we can see that things are very dense. We also have lots of components here on the back. And this is a multi-layer board. So most likely four layers or more. And that's why they have been able to produce it at such a small form factor. Now, one notable chip here on the back is this Cirrus Logic CLGD620, which is a flat panel CRT controller. And this in conjunction with the Cirrus Logic chip on the front uh, made up for a very popular combination of these kind of early mobile uh, optimized uh, LCD panel video solutions. This is the daughter board that uh, hooks up to the motherboard, which is primarily used for power delivery and battery charging. So there is a specific board for that. I think this one also has the uh, keyboard controller on it, but not 100% sure. But now on to the Dallas real time clock that we need to take a look at here, because in my opinion, this is preventing us from using the computer at its full power, configuring the hard drive and stuff like that. So it is soldered onto this uh, motherboard. So here we can see the pins on the back of the motherboard. So we're going to be needing to remove those. So the first thing that I am going to do is going to be adding some flux here to these pins. So I'm going to be using this flux pen to that. Just dip it over the various pins here. I'm also going to be adding some additional solder to each pins just to make sure that we will be able to desolder them more easily. And then I was thinking about trying out desoldering the component using this, you know, desolder wick or desolder braid. But I mean, I wasn't able to uh, to clear the pins using this method. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's related to my technique or the type of solder that they used or the manufacturing. I don't know. I had the same issue with the solder sucker. I just wasn't able to clear out these pins. So I ended up using my heat gun to get the chip off and that gave a reasonable result. The pins were relatively clean. The damage uh, was <laughs> limited. Um, some of the through holes uh, did get a bit of a beating, but I didn't expect that there were many issues. So I just inserted the new Dallas uh, DS128087A chip in there. Now this is a brand new chip that I ordered from DigiKey to replace this DS1287. Normally these should be compatible. And I usually also insert these in an uh, IC socket like this one, but um, because there is very little room in the laptop and it does increase the overall height of the Dallas uh, chip when uh, inserted on a PCB, I opted to not go for a socket because, you know, the, the clearance in terms of height is very limited here. There is this uh, kind of plasticky thing here that they use to kind of route the LCD flat cable here, which makes it a, a very tight fit for both a socket and a, a chip. So that's why I went with the solution to just insert the chip uh, directly. So yeah, all we had to do now is just solder the new chip onto the board, which is pretty straightforward, and then do a quick test. So I decided to just test the motherboard in conjunction with an external LCD display, but 
that doesn't sound good. So one long beep followed by three short beeps on an award BIOS typically means an issue with the video card. But because I didn't touch the area of the video card, I was a bit surprised to see this type of uh, error here. Now, obviously there is an issue with the video output because when I hook it up to the internal LCD display, I also get these weird artifacts. I also heard this kind of high pitch noise coming from the, the power section here on the laptop, which also seemed a bit strange. But most of the time I just got these kind of weird artifacts on the screen. Now, there's not a whole lot of consistency in terms of the kind of artifacts that you get on the screen, but the beep codes that you get are always the same. So at startup, you get a single beep, then you will get a long beep and three short beeps. Another beep. And again, followed by a long beep and two short beeps. Now, the beep codes definitely indicate a video issue, but I wasn't anywhere near the video chips, not at the front and not at the back of the PCB. I also wasn't anywhere near the video RAM. Obviously, I did replace the Dallas chip, so I don't know to what extent a, you know, a broken trace or something on the Dallas chip might um, cause this kind of beep codes to occur. Now I know that these newer DS12887 chips can cause some incompatibilities with older computers. So I did decide to insert a socket so that I could experiment with not only the original chip, but also the A chip. And I did have another DS12887 plus chip, which should be more compatible. But I got the same results with all three chips. So I tried to focus on the Dallas chip itself and the pins on the chip. So there I was able to check that the chip was getting powered. So there was five volts on the VCC, ground was hooked up correctly. All of the address lines I could trace back to the BIOS chip. The Motorola pin was pulled to ground to set it into Intel timing. So all of that seems to be okay. The CS pin was also pulled to ground. I did found the reset pin exposed on a header somewhere, but there were some pins like the AS, RW, DS, IRQ, and square wave pin that I wasn't able to trace down on the motherboard. Now I did do some voltage measurements and I didn't find any floating pins except for the square wave and the clear pin, but I'm not sure if you know measuring a stable voltage on one of these pins is sufficient enough to determine that no traces have been broken. But yeah, nevertheless, it has left me with a broken laptop now, which is very, very unfortunate. I was actually looking forward to getting this laptop back to life, but I'm kind of stuck at this point. I have no idea what else I can debug at this point. If there is anybody out here that can give me some clues, I would be welcoming your comments a lot. I hope you've enjoyed this video somewhat. I know it wasn't the expected outcome and I also really wanted to explore the machine a lot further than this. And it just goes to show how careful you need to be when you start working on PCBs like this, which are, you know, multi-layered boards and it's very easy to, you know, pull off a via or something which provides some kind of connection in one of the middle layers on this board. But, you know, feel free to leave a comment, give a thumbs up if you liked this video, check out my other retro content and who knows, perhaps we'll see this laptop popping up on the channel. So to conclude, I'm just going to show you some footage of when the laptop was in a better state. So perhaps, who knows, we might get to see it again running this game. I haven't given up on it completely, but you know, without schematics, it is going to be difficult to trace down where the actual problem is. If I ever get a replacement or a similar laptop, I might be able to debug it some more. But yeah, for now, I'm kind of stuck. Uh, but you know, you never know, you never know. Please consider subscribing to the channel to get updates. Hit that notification bell. Feel free to leave a comment and I hope to see you guys very, very soon. Bye bye.